Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Welcome. Hello. I'm Erin Axelrod, a partner at Lift Economy, and I am joined today by Imani Black, who founded Minorities in Aquaculture, 501c organization in October of 2020. This organization is designed to open doors for women who want to work in aquaculture, but meet challenges because of race and gender. Her work shines a light on the rich contributions of people like her family, who have a 200-year history working the waters of the Chesapeake. And this history is mostly omitted from the historical record because of their race and lack of access to literacy. She's been featured in the Huffington Post and in multiple aquaculture-related news media outlets, Without further ado, Imani, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much, Erin. I'm so excited to be here. We're so grateful to have you. And I want to get into how did you get into the aquaculture space? How did your work first come about? And take us on this journey of how you got to where you are today. Yeah, I'll give the the shorter version <laughs> that, that I usually give, but I've always been interested in the environment and conservation and restoration. And so when, you know, I was kind of deciding what I wanted to do as a career, that was like a clear, always a clear choice for me ever since I was like seven years old. And I didn't actually know what I wanted to do in like the environmental space, but I just knew I wanted to do something with restoration and conservation. I went to Old Dominion University and I got my marine biology degree and most of their marine biology classes are geared towards my like oceanography because we're right near like the ocean and things like that. And so that was a really fun kind of aspect of marine biology that I got to dive into that I hadn't gotten to dive into before. I did a study abroad ship in Belize. I studied sea urchin feeding patterns, like, you know, did the whole nine yards and really didn't feel that spark that like I had always felt like when I dreamt about having a uh, environmental career. I didn't want to get into academia at the time. I didn't want to become a professor or anything like that. And the way that academia had been presented to me at the time was that you go to undergrad, you go to grad school, you get PhD, do postdocs, then you're trying to be an associate professor, then tendered and all that. And I was like, I'm not trying to be a teacher, like at all. <laughs> and so um, luckily, after I got back from my study abroad trip, that was the summer before my junior year of college, I had an internship with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation doing oyster restoration and immediately just like fell in love with that. And it was a crew full of women who were just like really incredible and just really knowledgeable and just like really empowered me. And I remember, you know, after the first day working with them, I would like sat in my car and was like, oh yeah, like this is what I want to do for like the rest of my life. And then fast forward a little bit, I did that internship and my boss at the time was like, well, if you're into oyster restoration, have you tried out auger culture? Do you know what that is? And I was like, not really. At the time we were stationed at Virginia Institute of Marine Science in Gloucester, Virginia. And VIMS is like the hub for kind of the start of shellfish aquaculture culture in a lot of ways. They have a lot of, you know, really great experts that work in their aquaculture culture division and department and that have been really influential into the aquaculture culture industry. But their like genetics and breeding is really what they're known for. So I did their oyster aquaculture culture training program for about six months. And yeah, I just kind of fell in love with it through that. And then my career just, just kind of fell into it from there working in oyster farms and hatcheries and nurseries on the eastern shores of Virginia and Maryland. Do you consider Chesapeake Bay your home? And if so, tell us a little bit about where you live and why you love it and what's so special about the place you you grow oysters and, and seaweed and shellfish. 
So, yeah, I am a full-blown native of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I'm originally from a small town called Chestertown, which is kind of like mid-upper shore Chesapeake Bay. But my, you know, like you said before in, in the intro, you know, my family has been involved in commercial fisheries in the Chesapeake Bay for, you know, since the 1800s. And, that you know, that's the furthest that we can kind of date back to and find archives for. And But they're kind of all scattered throughout the Chesapeake Bay. And so, yeah, I would say that the Chesapeake Bay really is has this like unique and rich history about it. And it's one of the largest, you know, bodies of water in the world. And it houses millions of people all along its coastlines. So just having all those cultures, having all those traditions, just our traditions of being on the Eastern Shore and being kind of in coastal communities, along with all of the things that like our cultures have done traditionally and things like that. We just have like a a mix of really good heritage and really good history around here. At first, when I was growing up, I didn't really like Chesapeake Bay. I didn't really like where I lived. I live in, you know, I live in a small town. So I was like, I got to get out of here. I got to get out of school. Like when I get out of high school, I'm never coming back here. But now that I'm back after, you know, a few years, it's actually been really enlightening because I've really realized and rekindled my love for the Chesapeake Bay in a whole different way way because I'm doing just different things now in my career, now that I'm back in Maryland. And so you have this amazing story of not wanting to go into academia. How did you land on, do you grow food for people? You grow oysters and and yeah, what do you actually do and, and how, and how does the nonprofit relate? Yeah. So in my, so I've been an oyster farmer for the last six years. And so from when I graduated or like, you know, mid uh, senior year of college to 2020. And when I say oyster farmer, I mean, like I was out working in oyster farms, hatcheries and, and nurseries for oyster companies during that time. The last two and a half years of my oyster farming chapter. I call it chapter, not career, because I'm not done being an oyster farmer yet. But that kind of that last chapter, I was the assistant hatchery manager actually for the first privately owned shellfish hatchery in Maryland, doing, you know, larval production, animal husbandry, like all the hatchery stuff. Luckily, the company that I was at was kind of medium size and we got to move around as the seasons moved, which doesn't always happen in aquaculture. Usually you have big enough staff that if you're in the hatchery, you're in the hatchery for as long as it's open, which is like six months, and then you're off for six months. So I was really grateful to kind of move with the seasons of like hatchery, nursery, and then farm so that I was, you know, working all year round. The nonprofit, Minorities in Agriculture, fits into all of that because throughout that time of being an oyster farmer for six years, I had never really worked with another woman of color in a leadership role or any people of color in general in a leadership role. I had worked with other men of color that were laborers on farms and, you know, like, I would say, like, small-time managers of, like, they managed, like, a section, but they weren't, like, the big honcho, like, admin in leadership roles. So, yeah, I just basically have just been, I reflected on where I kind of was in 2020, unexpectedly lost my job in 2020, and I just was so frustrated by, my just where my career had ended up at that point in time, kind of the, some of the things that had happened over those two and a half years, and just my frustration of being a person of color in the diversity and inclusion conversation. And so there was not a lot of solidarity amongst the aquaculture industry at the time when it came to diversity and inclusion and Black Lives Matter and things like that. And, you know, the only kind of action items that was put out into the industry was that we were going to bring the conversation of diversity and inclusion into like conferences and forums and discussions and things like that. And I was like, whoa, whoa. These conferences cost like $600. And at the time, I had never been to a conference either. So I was like, who's going to be a part of that conversation? Not the people that you're trying to target. So in that moment, I just was like, all right, I'm on a hunt to find other 
women of color that are in our culture because at the time no one could give me a name or an answer or anything. But then also, too, like, okay, we've got to do a little bit more action than just talking about this. Like, we've been talking about diversity and inclusion for decades, and yet we still see a lack of diversity in marine sciences and just fisheries in general. And so I just really kind of took the step because I wanted to do some active change in in that sector because I love aquaculture culture and I want to have a viable career in it. So I felt like if I truly loved it, then I was going to invest as much as I could and do as much as I could within the industry. Awesome. And so grateful you did. <laughs> what are you most excited about with regards to your work right now? Oh, we just have so many things. I'm just like so excited just to see the way that MIA grows just over like the course of these months. You know, we've got this summer is our first summer having in the field interns. So MIA members, women of color that are a part of our community that are having the opportunity to go work out on farms for the summer, have a, you know, fully paid experience. So stipend, meal, transportation, housing, all of it, field gear, any kind of, you know, financial barriers or any barriers that may come in their way, MIA is there to support them. So I'm super excited about that. You know, we've got a a lot of really great partners that we're collaborating with on a lot of projects. And we've just got a, a lot of cool programs that are coming out this year. So this is a really big summer for MIA. And so I'm a little scared, but I'm also a little excited. <laughs> For our listeners who may not quite understand how aquaculture fits in to the need for environmentalism and, and our climate crisis and food security issues and all of that, can you just explain a little bit why it's so important that we have a diverse and equitable workforce, that we have people signing up and joining this this workforce to, to do the work of this restoration and, and food growing? Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of people... There's a lot of misconceptions around aquaculture because I've talked about this too with aquaculture colleagues of mine. Of we have this like kind of hush hush like tone in aquaculture of like we don't really we're doing a lot of great things but we don't really like share all of them that's you know going on. So I don't think that a lot of people realize like how intertwined aquaculture truly is to our our food resources. About 75% of the seafood that's already imported into the United States comes from global aquaculture. And with that too, that's bringing in over like $16.8 billion into the United States. So it's a huge industry already. And by probably 2050, aquaculture will be the only way of us to get seafood resources. So you can see the magnitude and the impact that it already has on our fisheries. And then for it to become the focal point, it's just really about people just need to know where their food comes from everywhere. You know, like just like in agriculture, you know, about 2% of the population are farmers that grow our food and they have to feed the other 98%. I mean, that's the same way in aquaculture. There's not a lot of people, you know, we're a big industry, but Compared to the amount of people that we have to supply and feed and all that, there's not a lot of, like, there's a labor shortage in aquaculture right now, and the same thing as agriculture. So when it comes to the food security of our future, aquaculture is going to be the center point of that. And I think that a lot of people need to know where their seafood's coming from, how it's being processed, how it's being harvested, how it's being handled, and where it's coming from. Because... Who doesn't want to know where their beautiful fish is coming from and know the farmer that's doing it and how they did it and that it's fresh and that it has all the nutrients that we need in our in our seafood protein. So, yeah, it's a really big part. And I really it's been one of my missions to, like, really get that point across to a lot of people. Absolutely. At Lift Economy, we have a deeply held belief that the transformation of our economic system has to involve more people becoming producers rather than just consumers. So yeah, thank you for laying that out so well. You also talked a little bit about the dynamics of these companies that you've worked with, whereby the maybe the ownership or the leadership is predominantly white and the labor force is maybe some people of color, but still needing more participation. Do you have any thoughts around like ownership and how how we can 
bring more diversity in who owns these companies and actually who's who's developing the the companies that are feeding people? I think that one people don't know something is a career until we give them the exposure to it. I think that's the the biggest issue in aquaculture culture right now is that not a lot of people are considering it as a career choice. So first and foremost, we have to really start exposing people and educating people and encouraging people to want to care about aquaculture, to want to care about our seafood resource. I mean, diversity is best for business anyway. I mean, it's there's studies, countless studies out there that are like companies that are really focused on diversity and inclusion and making their workforce diverse are more economically inclined and just more strategy and just culture inclined than other organizations that don't. And so just in all of that, We just have to keep moving forward in really getting that information out there, but also being really intentional about that information and not just being like, oh, cool. So like aquaculture does this and aquaculture does that. And like we're talking to inner city kids or like inner city people and they're like, I haven't seen the water in years. I've never been to the water. You know what I mean? They don't have a relationship with it. So I think in order for us to start improving our participation and engagement and lack of diversity within fisheries, we have to be we have to, one, put the upfront investment into the younger generations or just anybody that's interested because it's the environment. So, like, if you truly say that you love the environment, then, like, why would you want to exclude people from caring about it? You know, it shouldn't matter what color you are. If that you love the environment, then we can be friends. Like, it doesn't matter. But I think that also, too— We have to be really intentional about that education and really meet people where they are in their environmental education because it has to be a long lasting change, not just like a right here, right now, like, oh, that's really cool. Never really heard that word before. It's got to be like, oh, I see this in my everyday life. Like, oh, okay. So now when I get seafood now, now I know how to do this. And maybe I would be interested in like processing or like getting out on the farm or, you know, like it's got to be a gradual type of progression that way, I think. So beautifully said. Oh my goodness, there's so many pieces that you mentioned, and the initiatives you're you're building. These internships are incredible to do exactly what you're naming around making it a part of folks' daily lives and giving them that that feeling that that it can be. Are there other initiatives that MIA Minorities in Aquaculture is launching that are that you'd wanted to share a little bit with our listeners? One of the biggest things, obviously, that everyone knows about MIA is the internship aspect and the partnership aspect. But I think one of the things that we're really trying to emphasize is just our presence and our engagement in minority communities with minority youth as much as we can. Specifically for, you know, like Maryland, I, you know, as MIA just kind of grew and I started, you know, just finding women of color and having opportunities, they just were kind of scattered, some in Maryland, but just kind of scattered. And so our engagement and our presence was kind of everywhere else, but Maryland, Uh, not really, but like not as much as it was like in other states. And so now I we're we're just trying to be really intentional about our local minority communities. So doing a lot of community events with them, you know, really doing a lot of environmental education with our partners in Maryland and with our local minority groups, like making those connections, making those things happen. But I think that also too, that MIA is really we want to be the hub for the aquaculture industry of like, if I, if you need like someone to come and work for you, or you need a pool of applicants that have the credentials, have the skills, have the certifications that you're looking for. We Like MI wants to be that for the aquaculture industry. I fully intend for, you know, someone has that on their resume of like, oh, I'm a, you're an MIA member. Oh, interview over. I already know that you already know everything. You know what you need to know. I know that if you were to come here in this job, you could hit the ground running and do what you we need you to do. But that's only because MIA, we're going to put that investment up forward of like giving people the opportunity to go to conferences, giving people the opportunity to ha- get certifications like welding and plumbing and carpentry, you know, things that women, especially women of color, and especially in my experience, I was it was kind of like I wasn't exposed to those things working out on farms. It was like an intentional way. It was on purpose because, you know, being the only woman sometimes on a farm, you're a very 
soft little duckling in their eyes of like, you could be carrying like a tote of oysters and they're like, no, 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 don't let me, let me take that. And I'm like, okay, I played Division I lacrosse for four years. I'm pretty sure I can lift this 25 pound tote. I don't need your help for that, but okay. But I think that in that, I want to really give our MIA members the tools that I wasn't able to do, like the tools that people wouldn't show me because I was a woman or whatever. I want to break that stereotype, give them all the skills and be like, go build your career on your own terms. And let's take all the barriers and all the obstacles kind of out of your way as best as we can so that you can do that and do it into something that you love and an aspect of aquaculture that you love in a way that you love to do it. Incredibly needed that that clearing house you described of being able to match make qualified individuals with the jobs that are available and train them along the whole whole trajectory is really vital. And the other thing that you brought up for me that I, I want our listeners to think about is just the importance on an economy scale of having people that know how to do real things <laughs> like carpentry, <laughs> like plumbing. I just can you say a little bit more about that from your experience around the barriers to knowledge and why you feel it's so important? Yeah, I just think that, you know, in every industry, there are soft and hard skills that are needed, you know, to be successful in that industry. And of course, aquaculture is no different. You know, that we have a variety of different skills that are are needed that you can learn as you go throughout your career, because that's definitely me getting into it, not really knowing anything about aquaculture. Like that was my trajectory. And I'm still consistently learning about things that are happening in aquaculture. But I think, yeah, the barriers, and again, this is based on my experience, so nobody come for me if y'all are listening from the aquaculture industry. But I really think because it's a male-dominated field, like women just don't get the same treatment. And, you know, like I said, in my experience, I was the only woman out of 15 guys. I'm the first farm that I ever worked at. Culture and social shock. (laughs) Like, a real big shock. And I had to learn how to navigate that and learn how to adapt to that of like all hands on deck, but we don't mean you only it's a man's job or things like, oh, you can't use the pressure washer because one guy one time idiotically got hurt. And because you're probably not as smart as him, you're going to get hurt too. And I'm like, just because one, sorry to say idiot hurt themselves on a pressure washer, like doesn't mean that I will. Like, so I just think that the barriers are really, they're in misogyny and they're in those gender kind of like perceptions that women have, all women have of all races and colors in the fisheries because we're just looked at as like meek and weak and doing the office jobs and doing the desk jobs and things like that. And we're like, no, 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 no. We can do the infield jobs. We can do the physical intense labor jobs here. We just need to be given the opportunity to do so. So yeah, I just think it's a number of different things that I think that really women have been, because being in a male dominated field, it creates this boys club. And I think a lot of women struggle with that. I struggled with that of like, how do you navigate the boys club when they control everything? So yeah. Economics as a field has a very similar problem. So thank you. Thank you for persevering and all that you do. And we are wrapping up our conversation. I feel like this was just a tease to get more into all this. I'm curious, how can our listeners support you right now? Yeah. So like I said, we've got a lot of cool things coming up this summer and we are about to launch a fundraising event that is going to support and get kind of all of those like last funds for our summer interns. So all of those funds will go directly towards like stipend, transportation, housing, field gear, all of that. So be on the lookout for that. Also too, we are on all social medias. Just look up Minorities in Aquaculture or M-I-A-N-P-O. So Minorities in Aquaculture nonprofit organization. And it'll come up Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, all of that. And yeah, if you can't donate, like, share, tell your friends. And that's also a great way to support us too. We also have some merch coming out. So if anybody is interested in getting our classic black logo tees, and we've got some other merch items coming out. So that's also a way to support too. So three, three ways in 
different varieties. Awesome. And one other that I just thought of is if any of our listeners know a young woman of color that is interested in marine biology, by all means, send them send them your way. So. Yeah, absolutely. If you are a woman of color or you know a woman of color that is interested in fisheries and aquaculture and takes a look at our website and wants to join the community, like fill out the form. It's under the join tab on the website and fill out the membership submission form and that'll go straight to my email. I try to meet with every single member individually just so I can do that face to face and really ask them like, what do you need from MIA and like, how can we build this so that it's our community and our organization, not just mine. So yeah, if you're interested, yeah, come on, come on through. We're a good bunch. We've got about 80 women of color that are all incredible. They're brilliant and they just blow me away every time. So come join the fun. Wow. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your work with us today, Imani. Yes. It's such a pleasure. Thank you just for having me and giving me this opportunity. You've had incredible people on this podcast. So I'm excited to be a part of the conversation now. Mm, absolutely. <laughs> and keep up the good work. Enjoy, enjoy it. And thank you for caretaking our oceans and, and all that you do. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Next Economy Now is a production of Lift Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.